Happy Sabbath, everybody. Welcome. Also, welcome to those who are watching online. Uh, you know, sometimes we forget just how amazing that technology is nowadays to allow that to, to help and allow those who can't make it to still be able to worship God, right? Uh, as part of a church still, not just by themselves. Um, we have a lot of uh, different announcements today. Some of them I won't read through. They're, they're in the bulletin, but some of them I will be reading. <laughs> Um, I'll start out with the transfers. Um, this is my age here. I need to... All right. So we have Donna Olson from Carmel SDA, and we have Ann Ross, uh, who is transferring out um, to Fairfield Adventist Church. And then Wendy... I'm, that one I'm not going to be able to pronounce, so I won't try. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, going to the Indonesian church. So uh, these three are first readings. Um, so next week we'll have the second readings for those with the vote. And then we do have our pre-nominating committee. Um, so the members there are uh, myself, Elena Morocco, Zachary, um, Maria, Solomon, Michelle, and Irma. Um, so this is the second reading, so we do need to have a, a motion and a second. So, all right, we got a first and a second there. All those in favor? Aye. All right, that's passed. For those of you who are part of that, um, we're trying to be on top of things, so we were hoping that would pass today and have already planned to have the meeting uh, for the pre-nominating committee to get together and start working on who to ask to be on our actual nominating committee, that meeting will be right after church today. So uh, in the, the pastor's uh, study. Um, I guess just uh, one of our other you know, weekly kind of things is that if you have a special prayer and you would like to, just uh, please find myself or one of the other elders. And uh, we're always willing to have a prayer with anybody who feels that they they need to have a special prayer for them or their family or, or whatever the situation might be. So um, a couple other things. We have volleyball uh, tonight over at the school. We have uh, some cooking classes coming up. We also have a Pathfinder um, banquet. Um, lots of things going on. Like I mentioned, um, see your bulletin. Uh, one of the things that I was asked to, to talk about is remind folks that on April 27th, Rosemary and Charity are working to uh, have a small play for our children's uh, story that day. Um, they're looking for some of our teens uh, to help out and take part in the play. Um, so I wanted to make sure I mentioned that. Um, Let's see if there's anything else. I think that's uh, pretty much it for, uh, for today. So again, welcome everybody and happy Sabbath. We gather together. So from the 
bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we just are so grateful to be in your presence today. We thank you for the beautiful day that you've given us, and most of all, we thank you for the gift that you gave us in your Son. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Our first song for song service is number 462, Blessed Assurance. Together is number 240, Ferris, Lord Jesus.
service is I can only imagine. Deacons and deaconesses would come forward. Now is time for our offering. Um, this week it is for our local church budget, and you've all, as I think I've mentioned time and time again, you would get tired of hearing me say this, but until I was in college, I did not realize that my tithe did not help keep the lights on and help with the maintenance of the church building and things like that. I did not know that. I did not know that that was the local church budget offering that covered things like that. One of the things I want to mention, right, is that 
We have a beautiful church, but it is an aging building. So just remember that as uh, you're giving today. And uh, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you again for the beautiful day that you've given us. And we thank you for the many, many blessings that you've given us. And we ask that you'd bless both the monetary that we give back to you here today. And we ask that you bless those who cannot give today so that they can give in the future. And we ask that you'd bless those who are also giving of their talents and of their time, because we know that those are also things that you need of us and that we want to give back to you because you give us so much. We ask you again to just bless our church, to bless the people here, bless our school, and to continue to be with us. In your name we pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Um, today's scripture reading is in Philippians um, 2, 12. I'll give you a minute to get there. Um, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and, wait, both to, will and to do for his good pleasure. It's time for uh, prayer in our service today. So uh, if uh, you'd like to kneel um, or stand or let's uh, bow our heads. Jesus. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we come here in your presence today to worship you, to thank you for the beautiful day you've given us, the world that you've created for us, the group of people here in our church family, in our community. We ask that you'd continue to be with us, to guide us, to direct us, help us to grow closer to you, to put you first in our lives so that we can be an example to those around us, both here in our places of work, to our friends and family who may not know you yet. We ask that you'd forgive us because we are not perfect and we sin. And we ask that you forgive us our sins and help us to forgive those who sin against us, which can always be a difficult thing. We ask that you'd comfort those who have struggles in their lives. We know that pretty much everyone here does. And we ask that you continue to be with us, to comfort us, to carry us through those times. We thank you again just for the many, many blessings that you've given us in your church here and our school. And we ask that you'd send your holy presence to be with your servant Michelle today as she delivers your word to us. We ask that you'd continue to lift her up, be with her and her family, protect them and guide them. And we just thank you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, now is a children's story. Elena has the story today, so all the children, if you want to make your way down, and as they come down, children, don't forget to pick up the dollar bills that folks are giving you. They collect an offering that helps uh, with our school, and uh, we have an actual little representation of the school for them to put the money in, so... and girls okay let's try again good morning boys and girls good so this morning okay put up your hand if you are in adventurous club Adventurous Club. I know at our church we have adventurous. And we meet once a month. It's on a Sabbath. 
Good, I see a few hands, good. All right, what about, put your hands down, what about those that go to Pathfinders? Do we have any Pathfinders? Maybe in the, in the church, in the sanctuary? Yes, I see a few hands at the back. Pathfinders and adventurers. So, for the adventurers, do you enjoy coming to do activities on the Sabbaths that you meet, Nathaniel? Yes. What are some fun things that we do at Adventurous? Um, craft? Okay. What else? Caitlin, what else do you do at Adventurous? We tell stories about the Bible. Tell stories about the Bible. We paint. We paint. Ah, what else, Vinyana? You don't remember? Okay, okay, that's fine. We do lots of fun things in Adventurous Club, okay? And when you get to be 10 years old, okay, you move up to Pathfinders. And that's where the fun begins, a lot more fun. We go for outdoor campery. We go, um, some. I think last week, the, the bigger Pathfinders, they were doing, um, was it ice camping or snow camping? Snow camping, see? Lots of fun things to do, okay? We learn about Jesus. We learn to take care of ourselves. We learn um, the history of our church, okay? So this year for Pathfinders, okay, let me hold this up. This is a sash for adventurous, okay? So when you come to adventurous, if you do one of the little activities, you get to earn a little patch, okay? So this is for someone that, that lived in my, that, well, lives in my household. When they were little, they, this was their sash for adventurous, okay? And this is a Pathfinder sash, look. When you do fun stuff, you get to earn a patch, okay? This year, there will be a big Pathfinder campery where Pathfinders from all over the world, okay? They get to meet at a place in Gillette, Wyoming, okay? And this year, the theme of the big campery is Believe the Promise. Can you guys read with me? Believe the promise, okay? So in 2019, when we had the last campery, I'm going to bring this around, okay? The, the theme was chosen, okay? That was the theme. So if you get to grow up and then go attend one of these camperies, you earn a patch. This was the patch for 2019, Chosen, that was the theme, okay? You and I, we are chosen by God to share the good news with those of us, other kids maybe, or adults that don't know about Jesus, okay? But this year, our theme is believe the promise, okay? God is a promise keeper, okay? So when God says that he's going to do something, oh, you better believe it, kids. God keeps his promises, okay? In the Bible, there's a story about a man named Abraham. Abraham had to wait a long time before his promised son, Isaac, was born, okay? The theme for Campari, believe the promise. It's another promise, uh, another story in the Bible about a man named Moses, okay? God keeps his promises. That's what I want to leave with us today. God is a promise keeper. Okay, I know we're edgy. All right, let's close our eyes and we'll pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for being a promise keeper. We know that when you say something, you will make good of it. Bless these boys and girls. Bless their families too, and bless us as a church so that we hold hands together and bring up these young 
children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Dismiss us with your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. You can go back to your seats now. Amen, church. Uh, I just want to to let you know and uh, to think about if this should be a question like, if we were you, could you come to death for sin of which you were not a kid of? Could you still leave the heavens where you could receive all the praises and just come on earth to be denied? just like that, and then to die for a man whom you created. But we thank Jesus Christ, he made it. And here we are, we have life, not just life, but eternal life. And it was so amazing, and it is, and it shall so be amazing.
Thank you. That was beautiful. Happy Sabbath, church. Okay, so I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> Many of you might, might remember that about a year ago, I lost my big brother, Milton. And as I was preparing for this sermon, I thought back about 20 years when my brother was in the hospital for congestive heart failure. I went to see him in the hospital, and he was really distraught. And he said to me, Michelle, I think I've committed the unpardonable sin, and I'm afraid that I'm not good enough for heaven. We had a very serious talk, and we prayed, and I let him know that if he was worried about committing the sin, he had not committed it. As long as there's a flicker, God can work with that. But during my life, he's not the only one that has told me that they don't think they're good enough for heaven. So today, in my humble way, I'm going to try to address that question. Am I good enough for heaven? Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, please, I ask you to forgive any sins that I have so that I can spread your word, so that your Holy Spirit can work through me, so that I can share with your people a message that you have for them. Take me out of the way, Lord, and make my words your words. This I pray in the name of your Son, Jesus for he alone is worthy. Amen. Thank you. So, let's see. Good enough for heaven. I don't know if this is working. Bear with me, technology. He's coming to my rescue. There we go. So I must tell you a story today about the Olympics. The purpose of the Olympics is to honor those who excel in sports, swimming, track, weightlifting, skiboarding, skiing, all of that. Only the very best even make it to the Olympics. The story I'm going to share with you today is about a 15-year-old girl who actually trained well enough to qualify for the Olympics. Do we have any 15-year-olds in the crowd? I know we have some that can remember being 15. Okay. Help me out here. Is it not on? There we go. Okay. So her name was Shirley Babishoff, and in the 1972 Olympics in Munich, she actually won a gold medal in the relays. So imagine how hard she had to work at 15 to qualify to even be there, and the fact that she won a gold medal, just outstanding. So you know that she was looking forward four years for 1976 for the Olympics in Montreal. Oops. Can't go back. So, in 1976, she was now 19, she was expected to bring home multiple medals for the United States. She only won four silvers and another gold in the relay. She should have won. She worked hard enough to win. 
She trained hard and she qualified and she did her best. But her best was not good enough. Now, why wasn't her best good enough? It wasn't because in 1972, she faced the German swim team. They had five medals in the pool. They won two relay medals, three individual medals, but they didn't win a single gold medal. However, in 1976, they won 11 of the 13 gold medals. They set seven world records. They set two Olympic records. But Shirley knew that she didn't win because they cheated. So her best wasn't good enough because she was competing against people who had cheated. So instead of winning multiple gold medals, she went home. She did not win the lucrative speaking engagements. She did not win sports clothing endorsement. She did not win. And it was because of cheating. So her best was not good enough. It turns out that the German athletes were on what's called State Plan 14.25. This plan was a desperate attempt to prove the, the superiority of the East German communism. One doping expert dubbed the Olympics Plan 1425 as the Manhattan Project of Sports. It was that big a deal. Now, it was very good for competition. We could see the success of the swim team that year. Also, the man that you're looking at there, his name is Gord Bonk. He won the weightlifting champion, a silver that year. So, Plan 1425 was at great cost to the athletes. It cost them physically, it cost them emotionally. Gerd Bonk, he used the record, his use of steroids was the greatest consumption ever documented. They said that a whole herd of cattle could have been fattened up with what he used in one year. As a matter of fact, um, later in his life, his kidneys shut down, and they thought it was because of the high steroid use. So it came at a great cost. There was a story told about the, the, the East German swim team, female swim team. When they were in the training room, some Americans heard a very deep voice. And going to investigate, they discovered that it was a voice of one of the German females. And the girl asked her, you have a really deep voice. And she replied, we didn't come here to sing. <laughs> so there were so many qualified and capable athletes that were damaged by this Plan 1425, and so many that did not win when they should have because of that doping. So my question is, what can we learn from this about our Christian walk? Paul alludes to the Olympic Games in Corinthians where he says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Vince Lombardi once said, winning isn't everything, it's the only thing. 
That is a true statement when you take into consideration salvation. Salvation isn't everything. It's the only thing. This is a race we cannot afford to lose because it will cost us our eternal life. So in the Christian race, is your best good enough? The answer, of course, is no. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. So we are all broken sinners, every one of us. We want to go to heaven, but heaven is not for sinners. Heaven is for holy people, righteous people. So what hope do we have? When we realize that our best is not good enough, this is how we normally respond. I'll try harder. I'll do better. I'll take this more seriously. But that's an absolute disaster. And let me tell you why. It's a disaster because there is nothing we can offer God. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. In Philippians, Paul even says that his self-righteousness is like dung or manure. So what can we do to be good enough for heaven? There is some good news. Jesus never asked us to be good. He asked us to be holy. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. So Jesus made a promise and as the children's story told us, God keeps his promises. So what did he promise us to help us with this? This is the promise that he made. It's found in Luke 11, 11 through 13. There are many fathers in this group. If a son asks bread of any of you that is a father, will you give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will you, for a fish, give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? So if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to him who asks? Jesus promised to give us the Holy Spirit. Many of us look at our lives and we wonder, are we good enough for heaven? Well, we are not, but Jesus is. 1 John 3.34 says, And by this we know that he abides in us by his spirit whom he has given us. And I say whom because that tells you the Holy Spirit is a person. He is the third person of the Godhead. And he brings with him the presence of Jesus. Our best will never be good enough. Humans are broken, fallen, and unrighteous. But when we accept Jesus, he comes into our lives through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings with it the holiness, obedience, life-changing power, and perfect righteousness of Jesus. And that perfect righteousness qualifies us for heaven. So what's so special about the Holy Spirit? 
The Holy Spirit is the keys to the kingdom. So Jesus has promised us the keys to the kingdom. Let me share a quote with you. It may be in a minute. Okay, so I'll read the quote. It's from Ellen White, a letter that she wrote in 1897, and it says this. Many things that were desirable Christ had set before his disciples, but the gift of the Holy Spirit was all the all-powerful subject. In receiving the Holy Spirit, all blessings would be included. It is the richest gift of the greatest and most extensive plentitude. The, the capacity of the human agent alone determines the greatness of the gift that he may receive. God help us to receive the rich gift of the Holy Spirit. Have faith in God, trust in him, and you will have light and life. So what this quote says is that God has plenty of this gift to give us. We can only receive what we have the capacity to receive. So before the sermon, when I prayed that my sins be forgiven so the Holy Spirit can use me, I have to empty out everything to make room for that. It is the richest gift of the greatest and most extensive plenitude. With it, all other blessings would be included. Matthew 6.33 says this, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So the Holy Spirit is the keys to the kingdom. Now, how does that work? Does God give us performance enhancers like Plan 1425? No. Does he add to our best? Why would he add his best to a pile of manure? He doesn't do that. He comes into our life and he starts the work. When we surrender and allow him, he will complete the work within us. I call it Plan 213, Heaven's Plan 213. It is not performance-hancing drugs. It is simply Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus does the work for you. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you both to will and and to do of his good pleasures. All you need to do is cooperate. Being confident in this very thing, that he who began the good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus. So in Romans and Corinthians and Ephesians, Paul talks about the old man and the old man must die. And I hear many people say, but I'm a good person. Being a good person will not make you good enough for heaven. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Let's look at what the scripture says about the old man. So, as I've said, the Holy Spirit is not performance enhancing. It's the third person of the Godhead. What did God promise us? He promised us the keys to the kingdom. He promised that he would come back for us. In the meantime, he would send a comforter, and that's the Holy Spirit. But when he comes back for us, we won't win a gold medal he will place on our heads a gold crown. So 
my presentation isn't working quite right, but there are numerous scriptures that talks about making sure the old man is gone. There's a scripture in Hebrews, Hebrews 3, that says, and this is from the Living Bible, what makes us think we can escape if we are, are indifferent to the great salvation announced by the Lord Jesus himself and passed on to us by those who heard him speak? What makes us think we will escape? Remember, remember that my brother thought he had committed the unpardonable sin? If you'll turn in your Bibles to Matthew 12, 31, let's look at what that sin is. Matthew 12, 31, it says, and this is Jesus talking, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. So we can blaspheme God and be forgiven. But if we turn a stopped ear to the Holy Spirit, that will not be forgiven. If we refuse the, the best gift that God could give us, that will not be forgiven. That won't happen once, but it is a pattern of not listening to the Holy Spirit and not taking what he offers. It's habitually denying the Holy Spirit. And like I said, if you're worried about it, you have not committed it. But you get to a place where your conscience is seared and you don't even hear him anymore. You can't ask for forgiveness of a sin you don't think you've committed. That's the danger. So when God offers you the keys to the kingdom, when the Holy Spirit nudges your heart to give your heart to Jesus, do not ignore it. That's dangerous because none of us are promised tomorrow. So unlike the Olympics, there's no performance enhancing anything will help. Only Jesus. But because of Jesus, all of us can win the race. Every one of us. So let us put away the old man. Because he or she will never, ever be good enough. Jesus died to bear our sins, and he offers us his righteousness in its place, in place of our filthy rags. He will cover us with his righteousness and fit us for heaven, qualify us. Why should we continue to carry any sin and burden when he's already done that for us? We should accept his perfect righteousness and we should trust his amazing sacrifice. We should allow him to transform us. And when I, when I was given the idea that this was the message I needed to give, it was to two sets of people. One of those are people who have never heard of Jesus and have never accepted him as their savior. The other is for us who sit here in the pews. We might find ourselves far from God. And if we do, pray that God help us find our way back. We need to run back to him because time is short. So let's review. Our best is not good enough. Jesus has promised to give us the best gift he could ever give us as our Heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit. He 
He lives in us and will do the work for us. How do we receive that gift? We simply ask. And we need to renew that asking every morning. And we need to work on our relationship with God. And when I say work on our relationship with him, what I mean is that we need to pray. We need to have an active prayer life. And don't feel sorry for yourself and don't pray only for yourself. Pray for those around you. Study his word. There's power in his word. They were asked, what is truth? His word is truth. That's how we get to know him. And the third part of working on that relationship is sharing God with others. There is none of us who can hold all the love that God has for us. It always spills out, and we need to share that. I want to share another quote with you. This is about Jesus, who is our example in all things. For hours spent with God, he came forth morning by morning to bring the light of heaven to men. Daily, he received a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. In the early hours of the new day, the Lord awakened him from his slumber, and his soul and his lips were anointed with grace that he might impart to others. So my question is, If Jesus, when he was here, had to every day have a new baptism of the Holy Spirit, how much more do we need it? If he is our example in all things, let us follow this example. This tells me that he's not giving us a gift he's unfamiliar with. This is what helped him live a perfect life so that he could provide salvation for us. In closing, I want to tell you a story. We want to accept Heaven's Plan 213 that says God will work in us to will and to do his good work. We need to accept all that Jesus offers and let him do the work for us. 1 John 3, 34 there says that, and by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. In this story, there was a person that had to work a night shift. And at the end of a long night shift, they got into their car, and close to the freeway, they hopped on the freeway and headed home. And as they did, they noticed an 18-wheeler in the rearview mirror. And it got closer and closer. The person got a little frightened, so drove a little faster. And the semi drove a little faster. The person changed lanes. Maybe the truck wants to get by me. The truck changed lanes and continued following very, very closely. The person saw an exit. So they figured if I get off at an exit and there's a lot of people, I'll be safe. The truck got off the exit also and stayed very close. Pulled into the parking lot of a lit all-night Walmart. The truck pulled in right behind them. Before the person could do anything, The driver of the truck jumped out of the truck and ran toward the car and opened the back seat. You see, before the person left work, someone had gotten in the back seat and had a knife. The driver of the truck could see the danger in the back seat that the driver couldn't see. From the vantage high up, they could see down and the person was saved. That truck driver was the only person who could see the damage, the the danger. We have someone following us. 
The Bible said that God's love pursues us, chases after us. And it's because of his high vantage point and his experience here on earth. He knows what we're going through. He knows the danger that we're in. As a matter of fact, when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane for us, he didn't pray for us to be taken out of the world, but that we be protected from the evil one. So is anyone here running from the only one who can save us? If there's anyone here who has not committed their life to Jesus, I want to encourage you to do that. Find me or one of the other elders and let us pray because this is a race we cannot afford to lose. Behold, now is the day of salvation. If you feel that tug, please do not ignore it. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for pouring out all of heaven into the one gift of your Son and then of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we all need that fresh portion of the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. Lord, we know that our good is not good enough, but we know that your righteousness is Lord, give us all a hunger and thirst for that, that we may finish the work you have given us to do, that when you come back for us, we will be waiting for you. And as scripture says, we will say, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. Lord, I thank you again for all that you do for us. And I praise your name, for you alone are worthy. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Please stand and join us for the closing song, His Eye is on the Sparrow.
you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.